I'm Angela Unk, and I'm happy to welcome you to the 49th episode of the Clements Bookworm. And um, we're so happy to have you here this morning. Just in case you're joining us for the first time, I'm, I think a lot of people know how Zoom works at this point, but I do want to point out that here at the Clements Library, we really encourage you to chime in in the chat. Please change the setting to everyone so that everyone can see your comments and participate in the conversation. However, if you have a question, um, please put that in the Q&A section. That way we can keep those all together for the end of the presentation. And if you see something that someone else is asking that you also want to hear more about, you can give it a thumbs up and that upvotes the question and sends it to the top of the queue. As part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program, we have the live machine captioning turned on today. You can toggle that on or off or change the size as you need. And I can only control so much of what you see, but I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled, which allows you to see both the speaker and the slides. So you can move the separator to change the relative size of each. My colleagues, Ann Bennington Helber and Riss, are in the chat. Um, they'll be putting in information for you as we go along and keeping an eye on any information um, that you might be putting in. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, and our mission is to collect, preserve, share and promote the study and discussion of primary sources related to all aspects of history and culture of North America and the Caribbean, the Caribbean to about 1900. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Jibwa, Ottawa, and Badawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library also acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. Today, we also acknowledge that it's um, Native American Heritage Month and that we're presenting this program in conjunction with the Office of Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs and um, Buju to everyone out there who's um, joining us. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to put in your answers for the poll question. And I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Um, so I uh, see that there's a little bit of trickery in this question. Um, and I think Michael will talk about this a little bit later in um, the presentation as he shows um, one of the maps from the Clements Library. Uh, so the answer is technically 14, but there certainly was talk of 10. Is that a good way to describe it, do you think? Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we'll neither hear more up, about that. Yeah, neither of which ended up being the case, but but they were both discussed. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, all right. So, 
So today's episode is generously sponsored by a bookworm enthusiast who wanted to remain anonymous, but we um, thank you very much. And we appreciate everybody who signs in to participate in these conversations. So thank you. I'm happy to welcome Michael Whitgen to the bookworm this morning. Michael is a professor in the Department of History and the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University. And he is a citizen of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwa. He specializes in indigenous and early North American history, comparative borderlands, and the history of the early American Republic. He is here today to discuss his most recent book, Seeing Red, Indigenous Land, American Expansion, and the Political Economy of in North America. Welcome, Michael. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Okay. Um, a quick disclaimer. Uh, I am coming to you from my apartment in New York City. I have a really large dog who probably will be well behaved, but I also have people working on my apartment um, because of a plumbing emergency. So if you hear stuff, sorry. Um, well, thank you for welcoming us into your home. I know that that that's always a challenge, right? Indeed. Um, well, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to sort of be virtually at the Clements since most of this book was actually researched there. Um, a lot of the a lot of the source material that I used came from the Clements. Um, and I want to start the talk today uh, during the territorial period of the Old Northwest, which for Michigan, uh, as most of you well, maybe you don't know, but begins around 1805 and ends in 1837 when uh, the territory enters the Union as a state. Uh, however, rather than starting my talk in the Northwest Territories in general or Michigan specifically, I want to begin at the nation's capital. And in particular, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Capitol Rotunda. The British burned down the buildings of the US Capitol in Washington, D.C. in 1814 during the War of 1812. And the Capitol was rebuilt following the year around the central rotunda, which opened to the Congress and the public in 1824. The building was decorated with a series of bas relief murals uh, commissioned by President John Adams uh, and, and carved between 1824 and 1829. At the time of their completion, these murals were the only decorative elements uh, built into the rotunda. And congressmen and visitors who entered the building would look upon this four-sided interior where a bas relief sculpture carved into each wall provided narrative iconography depicting the national mythology of the United States. Anyone entering the rotunda would see uh, the preservation of Captain Smith by Pocahontas above the west entrance, uh, the landing of the pilgrims uh, above the east entrance, William Penn's treaty with the Indians over the north entrance, and finally, uh, conflict with Daniel Boone and the Indians over the south entrance. Uh, it's significant that the national mythology that uh, was imagined by President Adams and the artwork that he commissioned for the rotunda was entirely linked to Native peoples. Uh, the story of America presented in the iconography of these murals is synonymous with the story of Indigenous peoples in North America. In the decades following the creation of the United States, most of Americans would have encountered Native peoples on a regular basis. Even if they didn't interact with Native peoples in person, they would regularly have, uh, have, were the subject matter uh, the President's State of the Union, Indian removal debate was an important national issue in politics. Uh, Native characters featured prominently in popular cultural productions, such as James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans. Uh, this encounter with Indigenous North America would have been particularly true in a Western state like Michigan, where interactions with Native peoples were commonplace. In Michigan territory, interacting with Native peoples was a regular occurrence for individual settlers, for territorial officials, and for representatives of the federal government. In fact, the national mythology that linked American identity to the history of American Indians in the murals of the Capitol Rotunda represented the lived experience of the American people. So the first two murals commissioned, the preservation uh, of Captain Smith and the landing of the Pilgrims represent moments of encounter, but also moments of transfer. Pocahontas, the Indian princess, saves John Smith from the savagery of her father. Later, she marries an English colonist and converts to Christianity, signifying a joining of the fate of English settlers and native people in North America. 
Her story reflects the settlers' triumph over native savagery and the English assimilation of native nobility. Pocahontas embodies the civilizing mission of English colonization and by extension, the American Republic. In the second mural, the Wampanoag welcome the pilgrims who seek refuge in North America. They share their corn and teach the colonists to plant their own food crops, a sharing of the knowledge needed to survive in the new world. In both of these historic moments, Americans have found meaning. These mythological representations of the past, both the murals and the stories themselves, uh, do important ideological work. They signal an, an indigenous acceptance of European settlement. More importantly, they suggest an indigenous complicity with the forging of these new world settlements by European empires and their successor in the United States. The murals of William Penn and Daniel Boone uh, represent the face, uh, the other face of European empire. The histories imagined by these murals represent indigenous dispossession. The murals depicting Pocahontas and the pilgrim focus uh, less on the dispossession that followed English colonization and more on the peaceful assimilation of native North America through the advance of civilization. In both stories, we can see savagery yielding to civilization. Penn's treaty with the Indians tells a similar story, uh, but it more explicitly emphasizes the European acquisition of indigenous land. In effect, this mural represents another peaceful transfer, native peoples yielding their land to English colonists. In the mural, William Penn the Quaker, the embodiment of peace and nonviolence, shakes hands with Delaware chiefs, holding a signed treaty dated 1682 in his hand. This representation suggests the story of William Penn and his relationship with the Delaware. In 1681, uh, the King of England, Charles II, gave Penn a charter, making him the sole proprietor of 45,000 square miles territory uh, west of New Jersey. And this was in compensation for a debt the king owed to Penn's father. The grant made Penn the largest uh, landholder in British America. Charles had claimed possession of this territory by right of discovery, and he transferred this claim to William Penn. In truth, as Penn soon learned, this land was the homeland of the Delaware, or the Lenny Lenape, uh, whose descendants would assume leadership in the Confederacy of Nat Native Nations in the Northwest Territories, led by uh, famous Native leaders like Pontiac and Tecumseh. Arriving in his newly acquired territory in 1682, Penn traveled to the village of Shakamaxon, where he negotiated a treaty with the Delaware. Penn not only affirmed peace between the colony and the Delaware people, but also paid 1,200 pounds for land that he planned to sell to settlers. There is no surviving text of this treaty, and it was subsequently violated in the 18th century as Pennsylvania expanded deeper into the West, a recurring theme in America's history of treaty making. Nevertheless, this act of diplomacy, part of the mythology of William Penn, the man who treated Native peoples fairly as equals. This mural offers a vision of European expansion and the transfer of land from Natives to European settlers, but it also suggests that the potential for this process to unfold diplomatically and peacefully. Although one could also argue that there's a hidden and darker meaning in this mural, uh, angered by English expansion onto their lands in violation of the 1682 treaty, the Delaware fought against the English in the Seven Years' War and later against Americans during the Revolution and again in the Northwest Indian War in 1794 and in the War of 1812. These conflicts produce bitter violence in Pennsylvania and the Virginia backcountry, which is also part of the American popular culture, perhaps most famously in uh, Cooper's Last of the Mohicans or in The Legend of Daniel Boone. In other words, uh, Penn's treaty with the Indians foreshadowed a history of diplomatic failure, violence, and native dispossession. The idea of frontier violence where settlers seeking a better life in the Western territories faced armed resistance from bloodthirsty savages is also part of America's mythology. The story of Daniel Boone reflects this version of American history. And indeed, the final mural here, Conflict of Daniel Boone with the Indians, presents the story of violent conquest. In the mural, Daniel Boone engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a shirtless warrior, rifle in one hand, long knife in the other. They both stand on top of a dead Indian. Popularized by John Filson's autobiography, uh, published in 1784, Daniel Boone's story was the story of American expansion in the West. Quote, thus we behold Kentucky, Filson wrote, Lately, a howling wilderness, the habitation of savages and wild beasts become a fruitful land. This region, so favorably distinguished by nature, now become the habit of civilization, unquote. Daniel Boone, the Indian fighter, defender of frontier settlements, represented the American story as a story of conquest, a triumph of, over a wild and unsettled North American wilderness populated by bloodthirsty savages. 
This was a story of American pioneers pushing into the West to fulfill their destiny and settle the continent. In a sharp counterpoint to the story of William Penn, this mural suggests that there would be no place for Native peoples in the American Republic. The conflict of Daniel Boone marks a temporal as well as a thematic shift in the murals. The relief moves from the 17th to the 18th century and from the colonial era to the early national period in American history. The other murals hold out the possibility of indigenous and civilization. Boone's mural seems to foreclose such an inclusion. In this sense, the mural represents the shift from the revolutionary generation to the post-revolutionary generation. Political leaders like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington envisioned the possibility of some form of inclusion or assimilation for indigenous peoples, even if they imagined the demise of autonomous indigenous nations. Most of the second generation of political leadership in the Republic, including the governor of Michigan Territory, Lewis Cass, and President Andrew Jackson, the architects of what would become known as the Indian removal policy, saw no future for indigenous peoples in the U.S., either as nations, as unenfranchised subjects, or as citizens. In effect, the murals capture of the Capitol Rotunda, uh, commissioned to tell the story of the United States, depict the two strands of thought about the future of native peoples in the Republic assimilation or elimination. Whatever the future, however, to banish or to assimilate, the story of the founding of the United States is told as a story about the encounter between indigenous peoples of North America. I wanted to begin at the nation's capital because it compels us to think uh, on a national and even a global scale. The bas relief murals of the Capitol building were meant to reflect the history and the national mythology of the founding of the American Republic. These murals tell the story of America as understood by the first post-revolutionary generation of Americans. And what these murals tell us is that the people of the United States believed that they were part of a global story of discovery, the discovery of the new world. With this rhetorical sleight of hand, behold the existence of a new world, European powers claimed possession of North America by a right of discovery. Existing in a state of nature, the continent was an uncultivated wilderness and therefore an unsettled land. Using the same legal logic, European powers established dominion over their new possessions by converting land and resources into private property that in turn became part of the colonial settlements, effectively establishing sovereign governments where supposedly none had existed before. From European perspective, uh, immigrant communities in North America represented civilization and human progress. Native communities represented the uncivilized or savage past. They represented a primitive form of humanity that failed to advance beyond the state of nature. This was the political logic that imagined North America as a new world, an uncivilized continent waiting to be settled. Colonial settlers imagined their arrival as the coming of civilization to that new world. The people of the United States imagined their newly formed republic as a successor to this colonial project. American citizens and the government officials uniformly regarded Western expansion as a spreading of civilization across the North American wilderness. When the colonists arrived in North America, they found nothing they recognized as private property. Of course, they encountered Native peoples with their own system of territoriality, distinct land use practices, and political and social organization. However, by insisting on only recognizing the definition of property, property rights, and political self-determination specific to Western Europe, they could imagine that North America remained in a state of nature. Making this conceptual leap also required that colonizers see indigenous peoples as less than fully human. Their humanity was recognized, but they were uncivilized or savage, meaning that by their very nature, they would be subordinate to the civilized people of Europe and later the US. This contention that native peoples were uncivilized and therefore inferior and subordinate to the peoples of European descent was not based on any empirical evidence. It was instead based on an ontology or a political imaginary that assumed non-European peoples to be less than fully human while simultaneously presuming that European peoples represented the apex of humanity, civilization. To be of European descent and more importantly, to live according to social, political and economic mores and traditions of Western Europe was to be civilized. This was the ideology that shaped the political formation of the United States. For decades after its creation, the Republic, founded on the idea that all men were created equal, simply could not see native people as fully human. They were uncivilized, they were savages. Their land was terra nullis, empty land, an unsettled wilderness. The Republic also denied the full equality of women and accepted the enslavement of people of African descent. The revolution had profound implications for white men, but at its founding, the Union was far from perfect when it came to the recognition of universal human equality. 
The relationship of the Republic to Native peoples, however, had the added component that it also structured the relationship between the United States and land in North America. Government officials, Indian agents, and countless settlers felt compelled to settle this land, to colonize it, and to transform Native homelands into American homesteads. For the peoples of the United States, established citizens and newly arriving immigrants, uh, to imagine Native North America as anything other than unsettled wilderness would have been impossible. To think of the continent as a settled land, as a viable alternative to the United States, would have been in the domain of the unthinkable. That is, to imagine that the self-determination of indigenous peoples had resulted in the creation of permanent or permanent dominion over their North American homelands would have been what historian Michel Rolfrio has described as, quote, unthinkable history. For Americans like Thomas Jefferson, it was simply unthinkable to think about land in North America and imagine it as the inalienable land base of autonomous indigenous nations. Such a history would have been unthinkable. On the other hand, it was entirely inconceivable, or it was entirely conceivable to Jefferson that Napoleon Bonaparte, as the ruler of the French Empire, had the right and the power to transfer ownership over 800,000 acres uh, of territory controlled by indigenous peoples in the western interior of the United States, or of North America to the United States, with the Louisiana Purchase. And here I want to return again to the Northwest Territory and to Michigan. The logic behind European claims of discovery and behind land transfers like the Louisiana Purchase represent the same kind of logic that allowed the United States to claim possession of the Northwest Territory following the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. In 1783, the Treaty of uh, Paris, which ended this conflict, set the western boundaries of the United States at the east bank of the Mississippi River. The French Empire ceded this vast trans-Appalachian region to Great Britain when it lost the Seven Years' War. Britain ceded this region to the United States after the Revolution. In spite of these multiple claims of possession and sovereignty by Britain, France, and the United States, the country between the Appalachia Mountains and the Mississippi River was occupied and controlled by a multitude of autonomous indigenous nations. The near constant violence between natives and settlers in this so-called back country, west of the original 13 colonies uh, of the United States uh, during the Revolutionary War, provided ample evidence of the fact of this indigenous presence. In spite of this history, lawmakers in the United States began to formulate plans to settle this region as soon as the Revolutionary War was over. The Republic needed a way to settle the West without provoking endless conflicts with Native peoples. It also wanted to prevent new settlements from forming independent of the U.S. or becoming attached to one of the territories administered by European empire along the nation's southern and northern borders. In other words, the failure to expand not only meant leaving native land unsettled, it also carried the risk that a foreign power would bring civilization to the wilderness of North America and claim that territory as a foreign power. From this perspective, devising a land policy that facilitated the expansion of the United States was a significant political imperative. Accordingly, one of the first congressional committees formed following the revolution was the Committee on Indian Affairs which submitted a report to the Continental Congress on October 15th, 1783, arguing that the Indian policy of the Republic required the creation of a practical and enforceable land policy. Following their recommendation, Congress immediately formed new committees, chaired by Thomas Jefferson, charged with setting a trade policy with the Indians and formulating a plan to settle a Western territory claimed by the US. Their first attempt resulted in the short-lived land ordinance, of 1784, which imagined the West divided into 10 new states. Jefferson produced a map. Uh, this is the Jefferson Hartley map uh, that represented this scheme and actually shows 14 new states. It's a trick question. Um, the land uh, the, the land ordinance um, and the map drawn here by Jefferson uh, illustrate the outcome of the sort of land policy representing the complete erasure of Native peoples for the political landscape of North America. And returning our attention briefly to the national project represented by the founding of the Republic, it was also a reflection of the political imaginary that saw the continent as a new world, an unsettled and uncivilized space that remained trapped in a state of nature. Unsettled territory could be claimed by a civilized power. However, and the Congress worried that a, a land law that produced so many small states risked that those states might become detached uh, from the Republic and join a rival European power uh, or other uh, form an in, in independent colony on the continent. 
As a result of this year, the committee that formulated the land ordinance of 1784 was reconstituted and began working on a revision of the land law. The result was the Northwest Ordinance, a new law passed uh, by Congress in 1787 that concentrated the political authority of the federal government in the newly formed Western territories through the appointment of a territorial governor, secretary, and three judges. The new ordinance organized the Northwest Territory into a territory that would be further divided into no less than three and no more than five distinct states. Once this population, once the population reached 5,000 free uh, males in the new territory, uh, they could elect a general assembly uh, that would govern in consultation with these appointed officials. The Northwest Ordinance stipulated that, quote, all states which may be formed therein or shall ever remain part of the Confederacy of the United States, unquote, when the population reached 60,000 free inhabitants, the territory would be authorized to draft a state constitution and request admission to the union on an equal footing with the original 13 states. Significantly, all the states created by the Northwest Ordinance would be free states, uh, and all state constitutions had to contain a fugitive slave law. The Northwest Ordinance shifted the focus of Western settlement away from the establishment of new, fully enfranchised sovereign states. Instead, the ordinance sought to establish an effective territorial government that could secure property rights, enforce the rule of law, and manage relations with native peoples. Section 8 stipulated that the governor, quote, shall proceed from time to time, or as circumstances may require, to lay out the parts of a district in which Indian titles shall have been extinguished and turned into counties and townships. Unquote. The ordinance also guaranteed the right of inheritance for the estates of both residents and non-residents, asserted the right of habeas corpus, the right to a trial by jury, and ensured the sanctity of contracts as well as the freedom of religion. It also stipulated that all navigable waterways leading to the Mississippi and St. Lawrence Rivers shall be common highways and forever free. In effect, the Northwest Ordinance was designed to facilitate the sale and settlement of land in the public domain under a legal regime that was recognizable by the United States. In creating a legal mechanism for the orderly transfer of native land to white property holders, the federal authorities hoped to attract a steady flow of immigrants onto Western territory claimed by the US. Organized politically by the federal government and also minimized the possibility that settlers would seek to form new nation states independent of the Republic. In prohibiting the possible creation and settlement uh, or providing for the possible creation and settlement of up to five free states, the Northwest Ordinance provided a solution to the rapid expansion of slave power in the slave uh, states that were expanding across the Southwest. The ordinance designated this vast public domain of the trans Appalachian West as a subsidized land base for white settlers. In exchange for this transfer of wealth to white settlers, the free states of the Northwest Territory would guarantee the property rights of white Southerners. The fugitive slave law required in each new state constitution secured their right to enhold, uh, their right to hold enslaved black people as chattel property and to recover this property if enslaved individuals sought to secure their freedom by moving north to the free states. Native disposition underpinned the system of property rights, land transfers, and the eventual extension of the full franchise to white men willing to move into the Northwest Territory. Section 8 of the Ordinance of 1787 required federally appointed governors to work to extinguish native title on the indigenous homelands that would be part of the newly organized territories or free states. These lands, according to the ordinance, would then be converted into counties and townships by the governor. On the other hand, Article 3 of the Ordinance also stated that, quote, the utmost good faith should always be observed toward Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken with, from them without their consent, unquote. This pledge, however, came with a caveat, quote, they shall never be invaded or disturbed unless it is a just and lawful war authorized by Congress, unquote. Embodied in this kind of contradiction is the unthinkable history that sovereign native nations could have produced native homelands that were permanent settlements as opposed to unsettled wilderness. These contradictions were not only written into law, but also reflected the ideology that informed the social contract established by the Republic. Like the U.S. Constitution, also drafted in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was a legal document designed to create and preserve a politically legitimate settlement on territory that was part of the public domain of the U.S., but which remained unsettled from the perspective of the common law courts of the Republic. The Northwest Ordinance, in effect, provided a legal mechanism for reproducing the original 13 states of the Union in the West. The Northwest Ordinance reflected Jefferson's vision of the future for Native peoples living on lands claimed by the United States, 
their homelands will be ceded to the U.S. However, reflecting the same logic embodied in the murals of the Capitol Rotunda, Jefferson imagined two possible futures for Native people. As Jefferson informed Governor William Henry Harrison of the Indiana Territory in 1803, quote, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians, and they will in time rather incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi, end quote. This, he concluded, would result in, quote, the termination of their history most happy for themselves, end quote. This was a fate that he imagined for Native peoples, become citizens of the Republic and suffer a cultural death as Native people or leave. There would only be one nation within the boundaries of the territory claimed by the Republic. While Jefferson could not imagine an, an Indigenous future, he could at least imagine a path toward Indigenous assimilation. For most white Americans, citizens, and immigrants, this vision of the West open for settlement and emptied of indigenous nations must have been compelling. Indiana made the transition from territory to state in 16 years, becoming a state in 1816, meaning that at least 60,000 white settlers arrived during this time period. The state of Illinois made a similar transition, organized as a territory in 1809, admitted to the Union as a state in 1818. As Jefferson's letter to Governor Harrison suggests, however, these settlers did not arrive to discover empty wilderness. They moved into a country that still had an indigenous population. Although the demography of these territories would have been rapidly changing, these settlers lived with and around native peoples who stubbornly refused to go away or even to assimilate. The questions about their future and their place in the Republic would have been discussed not only by government officials like Jefferson and Harrison, but also by settlers throughout the Trans-Appalachia West. Uh, they'd be, after all, talking about their neighbors. This would have been particularly true for the American settlers who migrated to the region north and west of the Ohio River. Michigan was organized as a territory in, in 1805, the territorial map, uh, but they did not, the Michigan doesn't enter the Union as a state until 1837. Wisconsin is organized as a territory that same year, but didn't enter the Union as a state until 1848. In Minnesota, the last unsettled region of the Northwest Territory was not organized until 1849 and was admitted to the Union in 1858, shortly before the Civil War. In effect, throughout most of the Northwest Territory, Native peoples constituted the majority of the population on lands claimed by the U.S. in the first half of the 19th century. In 1820, while the southern tier of the Northwest Territory had been transformed into the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, with the requisite populations of 60,000 or more white settlers, the majority of the territory remained a homeland for a multitude of indigenous nations. In 1820, fewer than 9,000 white settlers lived in the Michigan Territory. And that's a territory that stretches from the Detroit River uh, east to the Mississippi River in the west. 23 years after the creation of the Northwest Ordinance, the majority of the Northwest Territory was in reality native territory. It was not an unsettled new world, but rather a native new world. A composite landscape of indigenous peoples living in their homelands and connected to the global market economy through trade that they were carrying out with European, American, and Canadian traders and trading companies. Native peoples in the Michigan Territory had effectively ignored or even rejected the civilizing mission of the United States, Equally significant, perhaps, virtually all the 9,000 white settlers who were living in the Michigan Territory ignored this as well. Most non-Native residents would have been engaged in the fur trade, either as merchants in Detroit or Prairie du Chien, or as traders living and working at posts attached to Native villages. In 1820, the fur trade dominated the political economy of Michigan, which meant that the white population actually needed Indian people to keep living as Indians. In the Southeast, King Cotton had transformed the economy of the region uh, in large Powerful native nations like the Cherokee and the Creek felt pressure to adapt to the political economy of the market economy of the U.S. Many native peoples in this region uh, of the Southeast became slave-owning commercial cotton farmers. The cotton economy was also drawing the capital and populations of the Upper South, both white and enslaved, into the burgeoning economies of Mississippi and Alabama, admitted to the unions as states in 1817 and 1819, respectively. Meanwhile, the Michigan Territory, with no direct access to water routes to the market cities in St. Louis and New Orleans, languished as a federally administered territory with a majority native population. That is, until the opening of the Erie Canal completed in 1825. By 1830, the native population of the Michigan Territory had grown to over 31,000 people, uh, 31,000 free non-native people. And that enumeration includes settlers living uh, as far west 
as the Mississippi, uh, and it was less, however, than the required number of population to be a state. But by 1834, uh, nine years after the opening of the Erie Canal, the settler population in the lower peninsula of Michigan alone, proper Michigan proper, as we know it today, had reached over 85,000 people. So that's in less than a, a decade, a growth from 9,000 to 85,000. This rapid transition upended the fur trade in the Great Lakes and placed enormous pressure on territorial officials to start extinguishing native title to native homelands and convert that land into public domain. This pressure culminated in the 1836 Treaty of Washington, um, negotiated by the United States with the Anishinaabe Dodomak of the Washington Territory. The Ogemak, or leaders of the bands of the Odawa and Ojibwe peoples living in the upper uh, and, and northern lower peninsula were taken to Washington, D.C., where they were convert, coerced into ceding approximately 13 million acres of land to the Republic for the price of an annual payment or an annuity of $30,000 for 20 years. This amounted to about seven cents per acre. The treaty also paid out $300,000 to traders who claimed the Anishinaabe owed them money for goods provided on credit and they had, that they'd failed to pay back the trade and processed animal peltry. It also allocated $150,000 to mixed race Anishinaabe uh, compensation for their part in this land session, but it also offering them a cash payment instead of the creation of a land base that reserved the, uh, a place for them in their homeland. The 1836 Treaty of Washington was one of a large number of treaties uh, that the United States negotiated with indigenous nations in the Northwest interior. The treaty process and the Northwest Territory provided the U.S. with a large, uh, largely peaceful means of transferring uh, or forcing the transfer of Native nations, uh, ceding their territory of their homelands to the Republic, even though the Republic already claimed dominion and sovereignty over this territory. These treaties represented a massive transfer of wealth from Native peoples to the citizens of the United States. Native peoples ceded the title of their lands to the federal government, which then converted that territory to the public domain of the United States. The federal government, acting as the sole proprietor of this land base, made it available for purchase uh, as private property to white settlers. These settlers were almost exclusively white. They took possession of this land as a sub at a subsidized rate uh, in exchange for selling these native homelands and making them part of the republic. They received an a, a excellent deal on their land, land purchases. Uh, in doing so, they entered into the social contract with the United States. They would not be colonists settling a foreign territory for the mother country, but rather citizens creating homesteads and settlements in Indian country and their government that, that their government had deemed to be unsettled land, which existed within their dominion. I apologize for the construction going off the corner there, if you can hear that. So under these terms, the Northwest Ordinance, uh, the, these settlements would be organized politically as territories administered by the U.S. federal government until the population grew to 60,000 uh, white settlers, at which point the territory would seek admission to the Union as a state. The treaty process in the Northwest Territory not only represented a massive transfer of wealth in the form of land transfers from Native peoples to white American settlers, they also represented a massive infusion of money in the form of specie or cash into the regional economy. These treaties resulted in annuities or cash payments, which, though designated for Native peoples, would mostly wind up in the hands of traders, territorial officials, and local merchants. Many of the white settlers, traders, and officials who claimed this money were able to do so because they'd married into the Native communities that were being forced to bargain with the U.S. These white interlocutors most often had Native wives and mixed-race Native children, and they facilitated the negotiation of these treaties by acting as interpreters, counselors, and debt collectors to the leadership of indigenous nations forced to negotiate their dispossession. Representatives of the federal government made it clear to native leaders that these treaties represented their only chance for receiving compensation for the land, which the U.S. was taking into its possession. In this sense, treaty making between native nations and the federal government represented an involuntary coercive process. Moreover, the Treaties, the treaty process, the land sessions, the annuity payments, and the providing of goods and provisions to Native negotiators represented a political economy of plunder. The political economy of plunder became the means by which the Republic of the United States expanded into the Old Northwest. Through the creation of the 1787 land law, the federal government uh, established a legal mechanism that linked state formation to economic production and indigenous dispossession. The law used the power of the federal government to extinguish native title to land and then facilitated the development of that land as private property. 
This represented a massive transfer of wealth from native peoples to US citizens as their homelands were converted into homesteads that constituted an expansion of the territory of the American Republic. This was not an economic transaction, but rather a plundering of native land and native wealth. The plunder economy not only stripped native peoples of their homelands, their most valuable resource, but also deprived them of a just compensation for this loss. Cash payments for their land were systematically claimed as debt by traders. The first $30,000 annuity payment, for example, over 28,000 was claimed as debt. Merchants, Indian agents, and others maximized their profit by seeking this uh, debt or by supplying the manufactured goods and food provisions that were also uh, allocated as part of the annuity payments to native peoples. In other words, double dipping, claiming debt, and getting compensated for providing goods. In effect, the Northwest Territory, the political economy of plunder represented a mode of colonization that the US masked as a physical expansion of the Republic onto unsettled territory. As soon as the economies of the new territories in the Northwest could accommodate 60,000 free settlers, they entered the Union as full-fledged states with all the rights and prerogatives of the original 13. In the Northwest Territory, the political economy of plunder was the engine behind economic growth that made it possible to create and economically develop new states. In other words, the United States acted as a colonial power, systematically subjugating and exploiting Native people and their resources. Even as the United States expanded at the expense of Native peoples, however, Indigenous people remained outsiders in a republic being created to their dispossession. But as Native peoples were not citizens in the United States, even though many, many Native peoples continued to live in the states being created out of the Northwest Territory. In this sense, the United States operated as both a settler colonial state and as a traditional exogenous colonial power. But when 13 of Great Britain's North American colonies rebelled and formed the United States, the citizens of this newly created republic imagined that they had created the continent's first post-colonial social formation. Political independence severed the colonial relationship that tethered the former colonies to the British Empire. In truth, however, the, while the republic created a new social contract between the settlers and their government, the United States as a new polity continued to function as a settler colony. This new society, with its origin as a collection of colonial settlements, had been established by the dispossession and displacement of indigenous people. Perhaps more importantly, the political framework that created the republic envisioned the need for continuous expansion into the indigenous territory along its western border. Most of the leading political and intellectual figures of the American Republic, from the revolutionary period to the early national period, believed that all of indigenous North America would eventually be incorporated into the United States. In effect, Americans, like their imperial predecessors, discovered the necessity of continuing the project of colonizing North America. This was the civilizing mission of the United States. Is it important to recognize that the civilizing mission of the United States was a totalizing ideological project? This was not merely a project aimed at civilizing Native people. This project was about the transformation of a continent, and that transformation never imagined a future for Native peoples. For citizens of the New Republic, the idea that a burgeoning United States would yield to the territorial sovereignty of Native nations would have been unthinkable. Treaty making, however, was a diplomatic process. This process allowed the U.S. to acquire Native land peacefully, but it also offered the possibility of the political future for Indigenous peoples to continue existing as Indigenous peoples. When Native nations signed treaties with the U.S., either uh, they either attempted to limit American expansion and maintain some measure of their homeland and their freedom, or they adopt, accepted the political bargain of inclusion promised by the American settler state. Either way, whatever path the Native nation chose represented an attempt to preserve an indigenous future. The idea of the civilizing mission central to America's Indian policy represented the promise of inclusion. Eliminate the Native through assimilation or removal with the promise of eventual assimilation and inclusion within society being created by the Republic. This bargain played out in dramatic fashion as America expanded into the Southwest, eliminating Native uh, Indians through forced removal and establishing new territories that were incorporated into the Republic. In the Northwest, in contrast, the U.S. was forced to act as a colonial state, an exogenous power forced into an ongoing relationship with a permanently subordinated Indigenous population, non-citizens, forced to live as colonial subjects on homelands claimed by the federal government. The American Republic was a, was a nation of settlers struggling to colonize Native North America. Accepting this fact, America has always been a colonial power, reveals American expansion for what it was and for what it was not. It was not a nation of immigrants settling a savage or untamed wilderness.
The Republic was a nation of settlers struggling to colonize Native North America. Thinking through the mechanics of Western expansion like the Northwest Ordinance or the iconography of the Capitol Rotunda, we see the United States locked in a fight with indigenous peoples about the meaning of place and belonging in North America. We see the American Republic as a colonial power doing what colonial powers do, subordinating native peoples while plundering their land and resources, and whenever it was legally possible and financially profitable, using enslaved people of African descent to do so. Accepting this reality, we are also forced to acknowledge that we cannot disentangle American history and indigenous history, nor can we disentangle the history of native dispossession from the history of slavery, Western expansion, or the emergence of free civil politics that would lead to the Civil War. In conclusion, the American experiment required indigenous dispossession, a far cry uh, from the idea of Thomas Jefferson as the Republic as an empire of liberty. Uh, and that concludes my talk, Miigwech. I'll stop my sharing here. Thank you, Michael. Um, I see we have some uh, questions coming in in the Q&A section, so keep them coming. I'm going to share my screen for just a moment to do a couple of housekeeping items, and then we'll move on to the questions. So I'll mention that um, as uh, someone who signed up for the bookworm, later today you'll receive uh, an email with a link and any resources that were mentioned in today's episode. So you can look forward to that. And you're also um, already signed up to receive a reminder for subsequent bookworms at the monthly program. So next month, we'll actually be celebrating our 50th episode of the bookworm on December 16th, as we welcomed Tamara Barnes from the Syndicuse Museum of Dentistry. Tamara will discuss two enchanting characters associated with teeth, the tooth fairy and maybe not quite so enchanting, the tooth worm. Um, surprising and delightful beliefs from all over the world will be explored, including ancient tales and modern day superstitions. Uh, so um, I hope that you'll join, join us for that. And uh, if you're on campus, check out the Syndicuse Museum. It's really quite spectacular uh, in the dental school. And also if you're on campus, we'll be hosting um, a tour next Tuesday, the 22nd, that you can register for at 4 p.m. And then again on the 16th and the 22nd. So um, we'd love to see you in person. Once again, I'd like to thank our generous bookworm sponsor for today's sponsorship. And if you're interested in sponsoring a future episode of The Bookworm, you can let Anne Bennington Helper or myself know. And we appreciate everyone who is um, a member of this community. All right, let's take a look at the questions. Um, I noticed that Roger asked a question that you address um, in the, I think the introduction of your book that, that might be good to start off um, answering. He says, at various points, you use the descriptive words, indigenous peoples, Native Americans, Indians, Native peoples, indigenous nations. Can one assume they are all acceptable in their context? Yes. How's that for the short answer? Um, yeah, you, 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 absolutely. Um, most Native people I know, uh, well, at least my generation, call themselves Indians. Um, Indians is the word Indians is in the Declaration of Independence. It's in the Constitution. Um, it's in most treaties. Um, over the years, people have grown less comfortable with it. Um, people, my son, who's twenty one, grew up uh, being told that that was a horrible word and it replaced it with Native American, which was designed to correct the misnomer of Indian, but really isn't that clear because people who are born in the U.S. can call themselves Native American. And so it's also, you know, it's not necessarily more accurate. If you wanted to be super accurate, I think you call people by what they call themselves. If you're uh, uh, from the Great Lakes area, likely that would be Anishinaabe, maybe a Wendat if you're Huron. 
Um, you could refer to, refer to people in that sense, but the terms are all pretty interchangeable. Uh, and I, I always tell my students, you know, if you're not comfortable saying Indian, and most most of them, uh, people in their 18s, 20s are not, then you can say Indigenous, Native, North, you know, Native American, whatever's comfortable for you. Thank you. You bet. Um, so uh, Tom Wagner is asking where the foot of the rapids um, was. Uh, in Ohio. It's, it's in Ohio. Actually, you know what? Um, let me pop this up real quick. A slide I did not, I'm, gonna, I'm sharing my screen again here with you. Uh, you know, this is, I, I should have switched to this. This is the, uh, the map of Michigan. To emphasize my point about um, this transfer power, Michigan at the time that it's created is really just Detroit. Uh, what makes Michigan is these 12 treaties that see the entirety of the rest of, of the state in uh, the course of you know, 20 years. Uh, foot of the Rapids, this is a treaty page, signature page from the treaty to Foot of the Rapids that established the University of Michigan. Um, and it, it's uh, it's stunning to see because it's a, this is 13 million acres transferred by this document. Um, a bunch of phonetically spelled indigenous names where the treaty center makes an X and then uh, the indigenous leader would touch the pen making the X. Um, the, the foot of the rapids is actually in the Miami River, uh, so northern Ohio. Um, that was where uh, the, that treaty was, was signed um, in 1817. And it didn't actually transfer the land. So the, the treaty, uh, I think Article 5 that sets up the land, it wasn't that the land was transferred and that's where the first university was built on. The land was transferred to the trustees who then sold the land and used the money from the land to, to fund the university. Thank you. Um... So uh, Tom is also asking a question about the federally granted reservations and, you know, when it was that they were considered to be sovereign. Uh, technically, the, any treaty, the treaty is a, doc, is a document between two sovereign nations, so they never weren't sovereign. Um, and the U.S., by engaging in a treaty with indigenous nation, recognizes its sovereignty. That is established in the case law of the United States with two uh, cases in the Marshall Court, um, Wooster v. Georgia and Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, which established uh, the, the sovereignty of indigenous nations um, in within the territorial boundaries of the US. Thank you. Um, so I think toward the end of your talk, um, you, answered this question, I, I, but, but maybe if there's anything else you want to clarify, was most of the land Native Americans lived on actually purchased or was it taken? Uh, technically both. Right. <laughs> I mean, the, the treaties um, purchased the land, uh, but the trees were entirely coerced. And, and on every single one of these treaty conferences, the Native people show up with the starting position, we don't want to sell land. We don't want to give it to you. And, and every time the U.S. negotiators say, you have no choice. The coercion varied why, how they were able to coerce people at different times, varied over time. But, you know, it was a course of pro, 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 project. It was not something Native peoples didn't come to the federal government and say, hey, we've got some land we want to sell you. It was always the other way around. And the first response from Native people was always, we don't want to sell the land. Um, it technically was purchased. The terms of a treaty uh, were an annuity, in this case, the 1836 treaty annuity of uh, $30,000 for 20 years, plus $30,000 in cash, uh, $30,000 most of it, which was cash, a certain portion, I think 9,000 or 10,000 was in goods and provisions. Um, but that, so as I mentioned, the $30,000 cash payout, the, the first cash payout, um, $2,800 made its way to Indian people. The rest was claimed by sellers. And this happened every single time. They would show up with cash to the, the, uh, to the treaty grounds to pay out the settlement. Uh, the tribes would gather and the settlement would largely go to the Native people who would show up uh, with ledgers claiming debt. And they would get paid first. Leftover money that made it to the Indian Indian population would then be given to the Indians in cash money, which they would in turn spend with the merchants who were also there collecting on debt because they were not banked. They did not have bank accounts. When they had money for an annuity payment, they transformed that money into a good or into a good. Uh, so the the merchants were the guys claiming the debts. The merchants were the people 
who would come up and claim the debts, and then whatever cash made to Indians would also come to them by purchasing of goods and services. So it's it's a pretty course of process. It's a that's why I say it's not just a land transfer; it's really the wealth uh, transfer of wealth, all the the sort of um, capital that represented in that land transfer that comes through these payments, all that essentially is making its way into mostly non-native peoples in the state, which really sort of funds or capitalize the development of the state as it develops into a ter from territory to state. Right, right. So um, I think in your book, you talk a little bit more about um, sort of the, the, the native peoples in places like Michigan being an integral part of the economy and therefore not being moved. Yeah, so one of the things to keep in mind is this is, uh, you know, one of the things that most people know or remember about Native history, as you kind of, go, if you're educated in the U.S., that is, uh, is you learn about Indian removal. And this is the Indian, the, talk, the time period of my talk here is the removal era when the U.S. passes a law in 1831 stipulating that Native people east of the Mississippi have to remove to the west, the Indian Territory, what is now Oklahoma. And in places like Mississippi and Alabama, where there's just so much demand for land, they're, they're able to affect that removal. But in places like Michigan, where the demand for land is, is not as intense, where the population pressure is not as intense, um, the Native people just say, no, we're not going to move. And the, the treaty ministers are forced to say, okay. Um, and so they're, they're, they just opt out of the removal uh, and choose not to, to go. But that that's what's happening. They get left behind um, on reservations that are increasingly circumcised or shrunk um, each time. Yeah. Um, so uh, June has an uh, interesting question. What connections and contrasts do you see between your book and the PECA? I don't know if I can pronounce this. Emma Lennon? Yes, New Indigenous Continent, which is currently getting a lot of attention in the press. It is. Pekka has a good agent, apparently. Um, uh, uh, you know, I have to admit that 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 um, I like I said, I guess he has a very good agent. He's gotten good press for that. Um, he's drawing on work that's been uh, going on for quite a while. There's a lot of scholars who've been really, I think, over the last 15, 20 years, have been really. Um, uh, centering North American history on this sort of indigenous experience and kind of uh, asking questions if we think about questions like like that I raised in the book that that um, in fact most of Michigan is, is demographically native if it is in 1805 when you make Michigan territory if we think of it as a native space which it is then we have to think about it a little bit differently um, and so there's a lot of people who've been telling stories like that um, for quite a while so he's building on that kind of scholarship um, and you know, so I, I don't know that he's saying anything that hasn't been out there for a while. I, I would say that um, it's a synthetic work and he's got a really good um, agent because they're getting him into the, to lots of different New York Times articles. Um, so Judy is wondering about the land bank movement and the recent returns of land to various tribal governments. Uh, I'm not sure you mean the land back movement. Oh, um, yeah, land back is really huge. Um, and people are essentially pushing for, uh, you know, where, where possible returning land. Uh, and as a idea, it's a broad idea. There's, there's lots of land. So let me give you a, a little example of, of, of both a, the sort of historical context and a contemporary thing. Historical context, this, the tree that we just talked about, the 1836, um, Washington trees seeded all that land, you know, in the northern uh, lower peninsula. Most of that land isn't really in demand. So the reason they're wanting to seed it is because of all the money that's being made. Um, so it's not like there's a ton of people want to move into what would now be, um, you know, Little Travers. Um, you know, even with the Erie Canal, that's still pretty far away from the American market economy. Some people want to do uh, logging in northern Michigan. Um, but by and large, most of that land um, stays in public domain until the late 19th century, when it's usually in the north, at least, uh, purchased by people who are uh, using it for logging purposes. Um, and my point is, what would happen if Little Travers got to hold on to their 
homeland, their own territory, and then sell it themselves in the 19th century uh, when they could have sold it for you know $100 an acre instead of seven cents an acre. Um, that would have been wealth that accrued to them over time instead of wealth that essentially accrued to the United States, um, or in many cases, actually, the United States took that wealth, um, turned it into land scripts, and then used those land scripts as a basis for funding uh, land grant colleges in the United States. Um, land grant colleges in every that every state has are funded through a land script um, uh, uh, dispersal that. Uh, the, the land scripts were entirely from uh, native land from treaties. So the entire land grant university system is funded uh, by the sale of native land, not you know, directly, but land scripts that the states then sold to get money to capitalize their their um, their funding of the founding of the universities. So that's, that's just a tangible way in which the sort of a really important public good in the United States would be impossible, but for the, the theft of native land, the dispossession. And so I think land back thinking about what to do about that, what responsibility do we have when we think about public goods like land grant universities um, that have been come from dispossessing Indian people. I think there's a responsibility uh, in, in terms of acknowledging that, uh, you know, in a practical sense, there are, there are numbers of uh, instances where people are giving land back. I think recently in, in New York here in New York State, um, the there was a large land held by the state that's been given back to the Onondaga, but the state wasn't using it. It was a uh, state land. I don't think it was even part of a park. I'm not sure how they came to possession of it, but they had acquired it through it transferred um, different hands. I think um, might have been used by logging uh, a land company at one point uh, in the 19th century. And the point is they had this large land they weren't using. They gave it back. Um, I, I know the University of Michigan um, has large properties in the Upper Peninsula, um, not all of which they are productively using. Just saying, you give that land back. Um, uh, so land back is generally pushing for, for that movement or trying to seek some sort of restitution uh, for land that was taken, or at least thinking through what our obligations are uh, on if we recognize the fact that, that um, North America was largely taken through a dispossession in the course of land theft process. So Robert is, um, he, his question is, you mentioned that assimilation was one possibility for indigenous peoples. At what point did the taking of native children to schools to achieve that goal? Did, did they start taking native children to schools to achieve that goal. I was fortunate to visit last year the Museum of Ojibwe Culture in St. Ignace, which documented some of the horrors of that practice. And before you answer, I'll just mention that um, maybe Anne can put in the chat uh, last November's bookworm, um, where we, we talked a lot more about that. And, and I, you know, from a personal point, I'll also mention that it was very successful. You know, my great grandmother was sent to a Native American boarding school and didn't return to the reservation. So. Uh, yeah, Mount Pleasant, which is probably where she went um, yep. in, in the Northern North Peninsula. It was a boarding school for a long time. Um, the, the, the most, at its most course of process, um, this happens in the late 19th century, post Civil War, last through the 20th century. Um, but you know, it's it's, it's a very complicated um, history. Um, my friend Brenda Child, who's a Red Lake Ojibwe from at the University of Minnesota, um, has a excellent book out on, on boarding schools. And you know, one of the things she points out is that there there's a there's a weird um, push and pull. There are children being taken from homes, but there are also um, periods in the early 20th century, in particular, where um, Native people were were fairly destitute and sometimes would agree to send their children to boarding schools because they had no means of providing for them. So they would um, risk sending them to these uh, hostile environments um, because it was the best hope for keeping them fed in their you know in 1920s um, during periods of, of deprivation for Native peoples and really uh, lots of people in North America. So there's this weird complicated history. Um, you know the the pattern isn't as long lived as it in Canada where they have the residential system the last well into the 20th century and was uh, even more harmful. And um, there, there's my friend that I just mentioned, Brendan Childs, uh, has a just really great essay where she talks about boarding school as a metaphor that, um, you know, the boarding school experience wasn't as extensive here as I mentioned as it was in Canada. And yet um, most um, 
Native people think of it as a reason for things like that you can broadly think of as cultural loss, which I think you have to would say that is really almost more the product of the totalizing colonial project the U.S. engaged in as opposed to specific boarding school. I mean, one reason there's not as much language is not dissimilar from, you know, second or third generation immigrant immigrant families where um, you're, you're, if you're an immigrant, your grandchildren are going to public schools, watching TV in English, looking on the internet, and everything's in English. Um, and so they're going to be more fluent in that than an, an indigenous language. And then you pile on all the colonial um, project of, of both um, stigmatizing native people, native language, native culture, uh, all these things contribute. It's a whole thing, not just boarding schools, which are a good symbol of it, but it's this whole colonial project that, that's really uh, been so corrosive for the retention of language and other cultural things. But I, I say all that with with um, with the caveat also that the, the language people are still working hard throughout the Great Lakes, throughout Anishinaabe, while keep, keep the language alive. There's uh, people really working on keeping it re revitalized and, and same applies for culture. Um, let's see. So, um, Kath Kathleen is wondering, how would teaching early history of the Republic change if it were taught with the narrative of the Republic of Plunder that you suggest? Is there a glimpse of this in the shift from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day or Thanksgiving as a day of mourning during Native American Heritage Month? The quick, uh, the <laughs> Thanksgiving is a whole complicated thing, and there's that historical event. It, it, it does all the things that it did. Um, it's also then that historical event is mobilized post Civil War as a national holiday. It's when Thanksgiving is established to try to reunify the nation. Uh, Phil Deloria, my good friend and also former Michigan uh, uh, colleague, has a great article in the New Yorker. You can, if you Google like Phil Deloria and the hi history of Thanksgiving, you can find it. It's a great little essay about you know Thanksgiving and the meaning of it. Um, you know the other uh, uh, parts about that in terms of education. I think it's profound. I mean, I think it's easy to think about the republic. Like I said, for these, for for most of these people, um, the founding generation people, um, it's just inconceivable for them to think about this territory. The, the war ends. There's the thirteen colonies. Then there's this massive space between the Appalachian Mountains and Mississippi, and for them, it's a wilderness. And they also know simultaneously that they're Indians throughout the space. Um, but it's inconceivable that you would think that you could leave that in control of Native people. Uh, that you would, even if you were going to establish. You know, relationships with them, or if you even thought about maybe incorporating them in a union somehow, but it's just inconceivable that you could think about that land as unsettled as as something that wasn't yours for the taking for for settlement for transformation to make money off of. And so I think just just wrapping your head around that that it's not in fact unsettled that uh, so much of America is predicated so much of what America America got to be America was through this expansion process that you know real wealth is created fortunes are created because what America offers that Europeans uh, that Europe did not offer was a promise of land you could be if you're uh, a working uh, tenant farmer in Wales you don't can imagine you're going to own your own land you're definitely not going to imagine that your children will own their own land but the promise of America is that everybody can imagine they can own land and in part that 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 promise only happens if we're going to agree that it's not native land it's just unsettled land that's being controlled by the federal government so i think just recognizing that, that the whole premise of america itself um is is based on acquiring this territory building a new new thing in this space that wasn't in fact empty and so acknowledging that that it wasn't empty means that we have to acknowledge that we were displacing uh, uh, other people from their own homeland from their own way of life and that's a huge thing to admit um and when you do that i think it makes you think things differently i mean you can grow up in michigan and you know if you're paying attention there's native people around michigan you go to a place like mackinac you go to you know you go to different uh, places like that, you, you know that there are Native people in a Native history, but you can kind of grow up in Ohio and maybe not know those things. And that's just the other side of the state, border, right? Um, because by the, by and large, uh, the people that make it through into the removal era uh, are inundated with settlers and essentially accept removal and, and go out west. Um, and so it's pretty easy to imagine there's just no Native history because uh, there's not a lot of Native presence uh, anymore in a state like that. Um, so I think acknowledging that is really important. Um, I think it's really important, like I said, not just on a fundamental level about what America is and how it came to be, but even, you know, things that have uh, resonance today, like, you know, public goods, like a, a, um, 
land grant colleges are funded by selling native land. The railroads that, that made it possible to open up the continent as a transcontinental, uh, uh, open the country as a transcontinental nation, again, public lands, you know. Um, so public lands have uh, formed the basis of public goods that we still use that were derived from uh, native people. The, the I saw um, actually um, somebody in the comments, Michael Stabler, who talked about his family uh, getting uh, land around 1831 in Ann Arbor. I mean, that's you, you're not responsible for dispossession. Your family isn't, but that land was available to those sellers um, because it had been taken from native people and put into a public domain. This process that we we, we described and it gets naturalized as it would have been for those settlers for Michael Stable's family. It would have been naturalized as this is public domain. It's this part of this free land that we're, this is the mission of the U.S. to settle that land, to improve it, to develop it. Uh, so it's naturalized for, for people to think about this as part of the American experience without thinking about it as something that was taken from another people uh, in order to make that experience possible. So I think just changing that mindset is hugely important. Thank you. Um, Amy says, congratulations, and asks one of my favorite questions. A project like this is not one that can be written up after six months or a year in the archives. Please share how long you worked on this project and um, you know a little more about the archival research you did and um, the institutions that you were. Um, um, in, in this is so true, I think. The thing with academia is it's any, when you get to the end, you get to stick, slap your name on the book and it's yours, but it's really, you know, it's just a collaborative thing. Um, the, the book wouldn't exist without the time I spent at the University of Michigan with the colleagues that I had there. Um, uh, I was at Michigan from when I graduated, finished my PhD in 2003 till um, 2018. So I went from a pre-doctoral candidate to a full professor at the University of Michigan and would not have produced the books that I produced without my experience there. And every one of my colleagues contributed to it in that sense. Um, and, um, you know, parts of this, parts of this book are actually in my dissertation that uh, didn't make it into the dissertation because it was the, the scope of, of a dissertation. If I wrote the dissertation, what I thought it would be, it would have been a 900 page book. Uh, <laughs> So having to scale back. So parts of this stuff I was I was looking at then, you know, the real heart of it came um, uh, in the 2000, uh, probably from 12, 2012 to 2018, with researching and writing, uh, working through different materials. Um, you know, at one point, I think I was uh, um, at the Clements and, and uh, Greg Dowd said something like, you know, you should look at that uh, Josiah Harmer stuff. And I was like, okay. And uh, so I did. It turned into a chapter or two. Um, you know, I, I mean, so uh, sometimes just stuff that that casually. Uh, um, and I spent lots of lots of time in. The, I had to leave at University of Michigan, the uh, Michigan Humanities um, Fellowship, which is the University of Michigan, which made it possible for me to write. And I was kind of at the Clements, so I was researching writing at the same time, which I could do because I was at the Clements, which is where all these sources were. Um, so I spent, there are many a, a, a winter day I spent in the Clements where I was the only person in the library, um, which is a great space to work in actually, um, if you're by yourself um, uh, doing that work. Um, so um, the materials there are incredible. The Josiah Harmer, uh, the, the guy who was the, ar the army officer in charge of the army of the Northwest uh, was there. Um, his stuff is all in the Clements in letter book form. Um, Amazing stuff. Uh, one of my favorite things was the um, the the um, half breed uh, the half breed archive. Um, half breed archive is what they call it. Um, mixed race people in the Republic were calling themselves half breeds, um, a term we would not use today. But there it is. It's that's it not only was it used commonly then, but it is what the actual archive is called. Uh, and this was this record for the 1836 treaty um, was compensation for this this. Uh, actually, this is 1837 treaty, I'm sorry, in Wisconsin, which is also in the book, which did what the 36 treaty did only in Wisconsin. Um, and part of that was a payment to mixed race people. And the the people who negotiated the treaty realized that actually mixed race people who might have claims to that fund could be spread throughout the Great Lakes because the fur trade, that's how it worked. Uh, and so they basically published notices in all the regional papers, including the free press, where they said, hey, we're holding a conference here at La Pointe, which is the, um, where the Apostle Islands are now, uh, where actually where Redcliffe, the, the, where my family's from, is uh, 
we're holding in 1836 show up in September for the month of September. And if you're a mixed race and you think you should have a portion of this. And so people from throughout the Great Lakes streamed to there to make their claims. And when they did, Lucius Lyons, the senator uh, from Michigan State or Michigan Territory, uh, with the help of um, sort of old hands in the fur trade, would talk, interview all these people and he would make little note cards uh, where they established their genealogy, where they came from, where they were who their parents were, where they were born. And these records are all at the Clements and they are amazing. And they have been scarcely used. I, I, I use them uh, really deeply in the fifth chapter of this book. Uh, I don't know that I've seen anybody else really use them. Uh, there was a woman named Teresa Shank, a scholar from University of Minnesota had a book published on this. That I don't even know if it was um, published by a press. I mean, it's in the Clements, but I haven't seen, I couldn't find it online. So there's very little, um, that's been done with these records. And it's a really phenomenal history of uh, indigenous and mixed race people throughout the Great Lakes, um, tracing their family stories, really amazing stuff. Um, so uh, to, to, um, to sum it up, I think all my, um, the, the book would not have been possible, but for the University of Michigan and my colleagues there and all the awesome people at the Clements who um, helped me work through that material. Thank you, thanks, yes, I hope lots of people we probably should i think i think we have a a good variety of um uh researchers we should make sure you take a look at the research fellowships that we have as well so um you can travel and come visit us um so there's um i this this is an interesting uh question that a couple of people have thumbs up but norm is asking was the granting of land to individuals at the Mount Pleasant Reservation as opposed to the tribe unique? I'm sorry, can you, somebody's talking. Can you say that the last part again? Oh, sure. Was the granting of land to individuals at the Mount Pleasant Reservation as opposed to the tribe unique? Uh, so the Mount Pleasant is a reservation. I'm a little confused, but I think I get the. Yeah. So so I, I can. My understanding, and I would have to go back and look at the details, though, is Norm, what they did is they, there was a reservation, and then at some point to civilize my people, they were given acreage separately and told that they had to farm it. And then at some point that was rescinded and everybody was brought back together. Yeah, so that, so this is this is in part this is happening in various forms during this time period, and, and Michigan is kind of unique because this is in the middle of the removal era, right? So right. the U.S. has passed the law saying Indians have to remove west of the Mississippi, and as I mentioned, most people in Michigan are just saying, "Yeah, we'll pass." Um, so what happens is on the ground they're they're trying varieties of workarounds for this, and the treaty process hasn't been as formalized, by the time we get to the later in the 19th century, it'll be much more formulaic, but in the early, like the um, treaty at the foot of the rapids, for example, is in 1817. That treaty, which is mostly Ohio territory, except for a little bits in Michigan, um, also sets aside um, individual land grants uh, for mixed race people. Um, they're given specific land grants, establishes a couple of land grants that were given to uh, leaders from various tribes um, outside of the settlement, like as an extra bonus for signing, um, we're going to give you this, uh, you know, one square mile acre, as it, that would have like the same kind of plot a settler would get through the Northwest Ordinance. Um, and, and that happens as a sort of way of negotiating the treaty, getting them to sign. Happens again in the Treaty of Saginaw in 1819. Um, the, the Saginaw Chippewas are saying, no, we won't sign. There's tons of pressure. And part of what happens is the, the log jam is broken when one of the traders working with one of the um, leaders of, of the Flint River uh, Ojibwe, uh, do a side deal with the governor where they're gonna give that trader and that uh, indigenous leader, um, they're gonna grant them land grants, one square mile quarter of the grant that you get from Northwest Ordinance for each of their children, because the trader has mixed race children, and they're gonna get separate land grants aside from the settlement, so that the, altogether the trader and this leader get 14 land parcels that's for their children. Um, so they're negotiating these weird deals where land's passing people's hands and the 36 treaty um, was originally designed because of the removal that they would sunset after five years. So there was a reserved territory, but after five years they would uh, have to give it up. And 
the people the Ojibwe said no, but uh, the schoolcraft and other agents said, well, don't worry, we'll have this revised and you can say they're permanently. And in the meantime, some of the indigenous people, Odawas, Ojibwe's, are working with different missionaries would sometimes buy land in fee simple title and then try to reorganize it. Um, the, the I think it was bought under Isaac McCoy, the, the missionary, uh, and it, but he didn't take possession of it. He was he buying it so the, the indigenous people he was working with could occupy. So all these weird little um, one-off deals where people got land um, as part of the treaty process, often through weird, not entirely on the up and up side deals um, as they were negotiating because it wasn't, um, they were supposed to be leaving, they weren't leaving. So that, that happens a lot through the 30s. It becomes much more systematic by the 40s and 50s and they quit doing those things. They stopped uh, granting side deals or land grants to individuals out of the treaty process. But here in the 18 teens to the 1830s, that's still happening. Yes, so... The short story is it's complicated. <laughs> yes, that is indeed the short story. <laughs> um, I see lots of other good questions. Maybe I was trying to see maybe one more that um, might. So Valerie's asking, do you think that Michigan's odd geography and the two peninsulas contributed to the Anishinaabe ability to stay on their land? Short answer, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the fact that it, um, before the Erie Canal, it's not really connected. Um, you know, if you're in Ohio, through the Ohio River, you can get to the Mississippi and you can, you've got, you know, markets throughout the Mississippi, you know, um, St. Louis, Memphis, New Orleans. Um, Michigan doesn't have that, especially in the UP. I mean, uh, you know, the settlement in the UP is really late 19th century when they when it's feasible to mine the region for its copper. But until that's feasible, that requires, you know, railroads and telegraphs and things like that, um, shipping lanes, all those things to make that sort of a, a space that where you can sort of extract uh, wealth. And that didn't happen until the 19th century. So all those things meant that there wasn't a lot of population pressure in Michigan, which meant that it was easier for Native people to stay, um, even when they were negotiating, you know, complicated uh, complicated deals, Angel, like your, your some of your relatives, even when they're negotiating complicated deals that are like, we're going to kind of own a land and kind of do this. It just makes it possible for people to um, uh, to stay in because also because the the indigenous world in the eighteen early eighteen hundreds is this complicated world. You're indigenous um, if you're living in a village with your mother and practicing season around, but you could also be indigenous if you're your half brother who's working with his French father in a trading mission at Sault Ste. Marie who lives you know mostly in town and you know all, all equally indigenous all considered because it's about relationships and being related not by phenotype or skin color and there's lots of different kinds of indigeneity that's happening it's only in the later in the 19th century when America starts saying well we need to start we need some order we need a color line indigenous is one thing uh and and they start containing what it can mean to be indigenous you got to be on a reservation you got to be Indian before then it's a lot more complicated and um, people, uh, indigeneity looks a lot of different ways and, and that proceeds, it, proce that proceeds it or happens in Michigan for a much longer period of time because it's less pressure. Um, you know, it's a different place than say Georgia was, um, where you're, you're Indian, you're removed, boom. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, uh, it definitely contributed to Michigan's unique history. Thank you. Okay. Um, I saw one more that I thought it might be good to, to address. So Tim is asking about why natives were not adopted as citizens of the US. And he goes on to say, it seems that some like John Ross and James Van had political contacts and financial power. So he's wondering about that citizenship. Piece. Sure. Um, John Ross and James Van didn't want to be citizens of the U.S. They wanted to be Cherokee citizens of the Cherokee Nation. Um, that's one short answer. Um, indigenous people thought of themselves as uh, uh, citizens of their own nation and did not want to give that up. Even the Cherokees who are, for people who are listening, you know, the Cherokees are people that lots of Americans are familiar with. They get removed. Um, they're trying mightily hard to look civilized to your American forces to avoid removal. Um, and as much as they did try to look civilized, they adopt, they make their language the written language, adopt a written constitution, all these different things. But one of the things they didn't want to give up was being Cherokee citizens. They didn't want to 
uh, give that up to become American. Um, so in a lot of ways, people didn't want to uh, be citizens. They were members of their own nations. Um, and the U.S. considered um, indigenous people similarly as um, alien citizens of a different nation. And so that persisted until 18, 1924, the, the Citizenship Act, which makes Indians citizens. Um, lots of mixed race people in particular in the Michigan Territory thought of themselves as almost like dual, dual nationals. They thought of themselves mixed race people in Michigan. There are large numbers of them who petitioned the government uh, for different reasons, but they think of themselves because they're partly not native as being American citizens, but also as being Ojibwe. And so they think of themselves as sort of um, dual na dual nationals um, it, before there was that kind of language for describing it, but they assert their, their American citizenship, they assert their indigenous identity. So that's very common too. Thank you. Well, this has been um, an amazing discussion and I appreciate so many people asking so many good questions and I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, and thank you too for staying on for so long and contributing to the discussion. Um, so thank you, Michael. We appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. Thank you for having me. It was, it was great. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye, everybody.